So thanks for everybody for joining. Um, if you haven't heard of Riding Into History, it's been around, we're in our 21st year now. And what we're gonna do is walk you through 20 years. We got a ton of pictures and a great video and kind of give you a history. It's something the BMW NEF Club's been involved with for much of that time. We'll give you a complete history of it. It's an awesome event. It's a concourse d'elegance of antique motorcycles um, and a big fundraiser for charities. And we've been supporting a variety of different charities. So we'll kind of walk everybody through um, where it all started and where it is today. So a little bit of background here. Billy Aldridge, who actually lives right down the road here near Jack, he's Jack's neighbor. They live in the same community, Air Park, Cannon Creek Airport. Um, in 2000, Billy Aldridge, who originally had this club called the Atlantic Beach Vintage Motorcycle Club. He just started his own club and a bunch of us belonged to it at the time. This was in the late 90s. We used to do rides and stuff. Um, he decided he was gonna organize a bike show to raise funds for the Susan G. Komen Cancer Foundation. And at the time they were doing the Pony Express Run, which they were doing like a, a ride across country and stopping in different cities and making big publicity events at it, raising funds. And Billy's wife had breast cancer. So he wanted to do something, his love of motorcycles, and combine that with um, a charity organization to help raise money for breast cancer prevention. So they were stopping at the World Golf Village in St. Augustine, which at the time was brand new. The World Golf Village is the hall of fame for golf throughout the country. Um, if you haven't been there, it's beautiful grounds. It's on the north side of St. Augustine. Um, I think it's exit 323, something like that now. Back, back then it was still the old numbering system, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, besides the golf courses, it's you know, got a top-notch hotel, the Renaissance Marriott now. Um, it's got a walk of champions, and we'll see quite a bit about it in the upcoming screens and the videos. So he, he organized it the first year. Um, it started pretty much as a small group. He had like 50 bikes or so, which were largely people involved in the, the ABVMC, which, how big were we back then? Maybe 100, 125 people in the club? About 100, yeah. Which was pretty cool, because this was just something we used to just meet on a Monday night or wherever it was, just local guys with old bikes, we'd get together and ride. Um, so we got 50 bikes or so coming out at the first time, and then started, and this was during bike week. Um, so at that point, Bill Robinson, who's joined us here, he and, and Billy got together and in 2001 said, let's make it an annual event. And Bill's a former marketing guy. He had his own marketing agency, a very successful one in Jacksonville before he retired. How many decades ago? Uh, about 103 years. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Um, and he named it Riding Into History because it's about antique bikes and the history of motorcycling, bringing that out to the world. So it was launched, effectively launched um, at the World Golf Village. In the beginning, like we said, it started during bike week, which you would think would be a great time to do it, but actually it was a lot of competition with everything going on in Daytona. So getting people to come up and publicizing an event 55, 60 miles north of where the epicenter of bike week was, a lot of competition. So it was decided in 2003, for better weather, less competition, we'll move the event into the springtime. And traditionally that was more like the second or third week of May, which we tried to stick with for many years um, to keep it kind of consistent. And if you're familiar with Northeast Florida, it's kind of event season. There's all kinds of stuff going on. The city of St. Augustine has an event just about every weekend from bike week to you know, race week, bike week, uh, St. Patrick's Day, the Rib Rhythm Ribs Festival. There's so many different things, the seafood festivals. So it's a very busy season, but you have better weather in the spring. Um, at that point, the charity was also changed to Buddy Check 12. It had been Susan G. Komen which is a breast cancer foundation. But Buddy Check 12 was founded locally by um, Jeannie Blaylock, who if you're in the Northeast Florida area, is it Channel 12? Um, she's a very famous, um, well-known anchor. She's been there for probably 20 something years. Um, she basically was, get, was putting on her own charity, which she started called um, Buddy Check 12, which is basically women giving themselves breast exams to make sure they're catching breast cancer early. Very successful. It's now all around the world, actually. Um, so we decided, they decided at the time, Bill and, Bill, Bill and Billy, that you know, it'd be better to send the money to a local charity, something where we get more representation. So it worked out really well because Jeannie also provided us with a lot of TV commercials and live TV segments. So we were often getting a lot of advertising on PSAs, public service announcements and things on local television. Um, that moved to springtime, which is usually the second or third week of May. Um, increased attendance quite a bit and brought in as many as 200 bikes. So we went from having a show of 50 bikes was just a small, let's do something to get together, started becoming a really 
you know, annual thing with a, a well-known name for bringing in a lot of top bikes. And that, that year it generated $14,000, which was a lot of money at the time for, to put on a bike show and be able to raise that money and give a check to Buddy Check 12. We became one of their biggest fundraisers. So then somewhere in the early 2000s, as this was going on, Bill here ran into a guy named Don Bradley. And it was at Bike Week. And he had a mm, typical Bike Week t-shirt. He saw some artwork on it that really impressed him. And through another mutual friend, Harris Turner, um, they basically convinced Don to donate his artwork to Riding Into History. And you'll see in a minute that that's, um, that became a very popular thing. Don was a great artist. He was a motorcycle fanatic. He, he had a shop at it one time, didn't he? A Yamaha shop down in West Palm? Yeah, Honda, yeah. Honda Yamaha. He was out of West Palm. A spectacular artist. You won't believe the artwork he did for us. Um, and he signed on, and Don went on to produce our poster artwork for the next 12 plus years um, before he passed away a few years back. Um, just phenomenal. And these posters are actually collector's items. Um, we had many years, we would have our Grand Marshal sign them. We got a gentleman here who's got a couple of them. Yeah. Um, they would be signed and numbered. The actual paintings themselves are huge, and we have a whole section on Don we'll go into. But um, you'll see, it's just phenomenal. There's probably nothing else like it in the world. And those, those posters alone raised thousands of dollars for the charities every year because we'd have our Grand Marshal sign them, and people would line up to get a signed copy of that um, from the Grand Marshal for the year. They actually used to steal them also. We'd put them up on the walls of various bike shops and stuff, and they would disappear because that's, that's how cool the posters were. People would keep them as collector's items. Um, so then, at that point, we didn't have any Grand Marshals yet. As of 2004, um, we had our actual first official Grand Marshal, meaning we'll bring a, a VIP to really give the event a lot of cachet and get it, you know, higher publicity. And how did we end up getting Craig Vetter? Um, Craig was actually speaking at Mid-Ohio, and I was there uh, seeing the event. And um, I noticed that his wife, Carol Vetter, was sitting off to the side. And at the end of the event, Craig Vetter, who you probably know, designed the Windjammer fairing and all kind of motorcycles on uh, the Hurricane uh, original motorcycle, et cetera, for Triumph. Uh, really well-known uh, guy in motorcycling. But I could see that his wife was kind of running things from the side. So after Craig made his comments, I wanted to see if he could be the Grand Marshal for our event. But I didn't go to Craig, I went to Carol. And I said to Carol, I said, uh, here's what we have, charity event, et cetera, et cetera. You think uh, Craig would be interested? And she said, yes, we'll do it. <laughs> and that was it. Craig never made a decision. Carol made the decision. And they came not only the first year as a Grand Marshal, but in subsequent years, they would come and support our event and help us really kick it off uh, nationally. And they live out in Carmel, California. They would fly out at their own expense, just come out to see our show every year. And they still, we're still in touch with them. We go out and visit them when we're out there. Just wonderful couple, great friends of the event, still very involved in helping us in any way he can. We run into them at events like Barber and elsewhere, all kinds of things around the country. When you go to other shows, we see them all the time. Um, so somewhere around that same time, Billy and Jackie Aldridge actually moved out here. That's how they became Jack Wells' neighbor. Um, Billy had been retired for many years, and uh, he, they moved to an air park. And basically his club that started all this, the ABVMC, which wasn't a charter to anything. It was just Billy's personal club that we all belonged to. There was, do we have dues? Uh, yes, we did have dues. We did have dues because we had like a newsletter or something. Right. There was no officers other than Billy. We called him the benevolent dictator because <laughs> he, he kind of ran the club. He organized everything. And we just showed up with our old bikes and went for rides. It was really cool. Um, and, you know, we got together for dinner and stuff every week. But he moved out here. And unfortunately, then ABVMC started to fall apart just because Billy wasn't there to run it and organize stuff. And that became a problem because that was kind of our, the well we always went to both to wrangle up a lot of bikes to bring to the show and to bring volunteers because it takes a lot of volunteers on the day the weekend of the event to run the show you know to set up tear down um do all the work for it so at that time we approached jim stevenson who some of you may know if you've been to this rally jim was our former president of bmw nef he and millie were very very involved they're up in their years now in their early 80s they're still very good friends of ours they don't make it out to the rally or can't ride anymore they're at the age they just can no longer participate in those kind of things but they agreed that we would change the relationship of riding into history and that the BMW club, the one that puts on this rally, would also be the ones presenting the riding into history event. So ABVMC was still around. It was just kind of starting to dwindle and fall apart. So we made them co-members, co-presenters. So basically both clubs put on the event. And 
as we went along, we also brought in a lot of other clubs. And this is just really important because this is a, writing and history is a totally volunteer event. There's no paid staff, there's no paid salary. We are legally a 501c3 charity. So we are very cheap in terms of spending money other than to put on a top quality show. So we, we really depend on our clubs and the members of our clubs to help us run this. Um, so basically over the years, we've brought in other clubs and we're gonna have show you a section on all the clubs that are sponsored it and there's quite a few of them. Um, and as the years went on, by that time we had basically the event had morphed into a much more complex event. It actually had two big things at that point. It had the Concourse d'Elegance, which was the big show we put on at the World Golf Village, which was an all-day Saturday event. We'd be out there at 5 in the morning getting set up for it. And then on Saturday night, we had what we called Biker's Ball, which was kind of a riff on like a black tie event, only it was more like black leathers or, you know, <laughs> costume party for bikers. It was quite a bit of fun. It was kind of outrageous. Um, but it was a big dinner party. and we, how many people do we used to get to that? Because it was in a big banquet hall. Uh, 250, 300. Yeah, 250, 300 people in a giant banquet hall with a band and, you know, all kinds of entertainment and, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. We'd have a big silent auction. And that's how we raised money. Basically, you know, the dinner itself didn't really make money for us. We would basically charge what it cost us to throw the party. But then the silent auction would be donated by a lot of sponsors would donate things. And we'd raise money through the silent auction, as well as a lot of Don's artwork, which would sell at the silent auction. Then somewhere along the line, John Langstrom, is anyone familiar with Blue Moon Cycles up in Atlanta? Yeah. John's a friend of ours. He would come to the event and he would bring a lot of bikes because he's got a pretty cool BMW collection. Um, he suggested that we add a third event. So we now got the, the Bikers Ball, the main event of the Concourse d'Elegance, and he said we should offer a, a Grand Marshal ride for the Concourse entrance. So we now had three major parts of the event. The silent auction has always kind of fallen under the, the Bikers Ball and still, it's still there under a slightly different um, version of the biker's ball. But we now had three major events. So the, the event had grown. It was now becoming very big, and it had a lot of piece, moving pieces to it. So as that Grand Marshal Tour was born, it became very popular that we started doing a ride on Friday, the day before the event. And the Grand Marshal, we'd always fly them in, usually on Thursday night. We'd fly them in from out of town. Um, we'd get them a vintage bike to ride. And we'd organize a ride with the Grand Marshal, whoever it was, Craig Vetter, whatever, leading a ride through the county, um, multiple counties often, of um, Northeast Florida, St. John's, Duval, um, Flagler, Volusia, wherever we were going, um, Clay. And we'd lead a ride of vintage bikes, go somewhere for lunch, and you get to sit and have lunch with, you know, a cool VIP, somebody who's been in the racing industry, the motorcycle industry. It was just a lot of fun, very casual. We had to limit it. It would be at most 50 bikes, 60 people, just because we had to limit the size of it. So it would constantly just sell out. It was first come, first serve. And that was for the people who brought their bikes into the show. And that was important because people who bring their bikes to the show go through a lot of work. You know, they prep their bike, they trailer it. Many people, like Jack Wells used to bring 12, 15 bikes sometimes. Yeah, yeah, because Jack, if you don't know Jack, Jack has a hangar with about 100 motorcycles in it. <laughs> He's got a enormous collection. And Jack's been involved in this since the early days, bringing his bikes, beautiful collection of BMWs, all kinds of crazy stuff.
your bike you use your bike and you enjoy your motorcycle and uh, by the Leishman, Gordon and Alice and the Grand Marshal and the winner of the Spirit of Riding in the History Award is uh, Greg Foster. Hey, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you brought the good decor. I don't know how big the deserve that. And if you got the I always say before the start of the ride, we all have the same prayer. Dear God, please let my bike start. <laughs> Even more so for triumph. <laughs> I used to spend my evenings by myself, you know. Went through every number on my telephone. I thought that all I needed was the one to hold, but I was wrong. So today, as it's all evolved, we still have the three big events. Um, we now have the Concourse d'Elegance features 300 plus motorcycles. We get collectors bringing bikes from all over the country. We just opened registration about three weeks ago, and I've already got probably in the neighborhood of 70 bikes committed. I've got Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, New York, all throughout the Southeast. We've had Colorado. I mean, you gotta go through a lot of trouble if you wanna bring out a couple of your bikes from Colorado to put in a show. So these people are very dedicated, and these are the top collectors. Um, and they bring in everything. It's, it basically, we've now evolved into it's antiques only. We used to say vintage, 
but it's now got to be antiques 35 years or older is what AMCA defines as antique. We do do all kinds of special displays of racing bikes, things of historical or national significance, and bring out all kinds of marks that, of things most people never heard of. People are always surprised to come around and see models and makes, and they'll say, where is that? What country did that come from? And it's really a, a very educational thing, and it's also very family friendly. People bring their kids. Um, it's in a beautiful setting. So each year, we vary the mark. This year, it's gonna be the, br the brilliant British bikes, but we have about five or six different featured marks and we rotate them. So every year there's like a different theme to the event. So like British bikes for this year, they won't come around again for another six or seven years and we'll have them again. And it, it's kind of that thing where, you know, we have guys who have all kinds of bikes that, you know, now they're all getting their British bikes ready to bring out this year. Next year, it could be their Ducatis they're bringing out or their BMWs or, you know, it depends what the mark is we're gonna change. Um, the motorcycles are all professionally judged and trophies are awarded. We give out very nice trophies. They're very high quality um, and they're very hard to get at this point. Um, so if you win at, at Riding Into History, you're not only competing against some of the best collectors um, on one of the finest stages, but if you win, you're, you're in a very large class and you've got a very good quality bike and it's been judged by people who really know what they're doing. But here's the past 20 years. So basically we got, this was the, the date of the event. You can't see a lot of these were May because we were always classically in May. We started moving it up to April. You can see our Grand Marshals here. We've got, I'll stand back here because I can read it from this screen. We got Craig Vetter. We had Dennis Gage. Remember classic cars? Yeah. Dennis Gage was one of our early Grand Marshals. We had Peter Egan, car and driver, uh, motorcycle magazines, very famous. Um, what I got above that? Clement Salvatore. Kevin Schwantz, Mitch Bain, Buzz Cantor, and Dale Walksler. You know Dale Walksler from Wheels Through Time? He, he's been our Grand Marshal. He's also brought bikes and things down with him. Uh, I can't even read that. Dave Despain. Mert. Uh, yep. Yeah, that was, that was a good year for the Bikers Ball because we played the movie on any Sunday. And, of course, he starred in it. It was pretty cool. Everyone knows that one. Uh, Malcolm Smith, we got a Miguel Duhamel. Miguel Duhamel was so funny because it was actually him and his father, Yvonne. Yeah, and yeah. if you're not familiar with his family, of course, Miguel would race for Honda for years, won the Daytona 500 numerous times. His father was a very famous racer and a snowmobile racer from, I believe they're from, was it Montreal or Quebec? Uh, Quebec. Quebec, okay. He didn't speak English. He only spoke French. But Miguel is just like such a cut up. I mean, he wanted to stop everywhere and go to karaoke bars and sing and him and his mom, because his, his mom and his dad came along with him and his girlfriend. And, you know, we ferry him around, take him to all the different events, and we do the Grand Marshal ride stuff. He was just such a blast. That guy is just like nonstop, just fun. And he's, he's still extremely active. He lives in Vegas. He mountain bikes and skis, and he's very physically fit. He's just... The father? No, his son. The father's... His father is almost completely hard of hearing because from racing snowmobiles and stuff, didn't wear ear protection. So, so between not speaking English and not being able to hear, we had a little bit of a communication gap, but usually... His mother would help translate that. Um, but Miguel was, Miguel was by far one of our funniest and most gregarious um, ones. We had Scott Parker and Bill Werner. Who's Scotty Parker, remember the flat track guy? He was a lot of fun. He's, what was, what's his home base now, Wisconsin? Uh, Milwaukee, sure. somewhere around there? Yeah. He's, a, he's up in the upper Midwest. Um, he was a lot of fun also. Um, I could tell you stories about that on our Grand Marshal Award. Um, our last year, Gloria Struck. Has anyone heard of Gloria Struck? She is now, she must be 93 now, 95 now maybe. It's been two years. 95 now. She's in the um, Motorcycle Hall of Fame. She's ridden Harleys and Indians all over the world. Um, she still rides. Not as much as she used to because she's 95, but she still rides. Um, she's famous in, in the world of women's motorcycling. She was a hoot. She could tell stories. She's published her own book at 90 years old or so. She wrote her own book kind of like an autobiography of her life on motorcycles. She was a hoot. She could, she could run circles around most of us. I mean, she just didn't slow down. And trying to get a hold of her, she was at a different state almost every day. I would try to call her. Every week, I'd try to call her to just coordinate a radio interview or something we were doing with her. And she was somewhere else doing a book signing or an event. Um, she's like a rock star when she goes somewhere. She's just like everybody. She draws crowds. So she was a lot of fun. As you can see, we, we, we vary the mark. So, you know, it starts down. I'm sorry I can't read this. 
it's just a very small screen in terms of not being able to see it. But we vary the marks. So it started American. If you can almost see this, it's American, British, German, Japanese. Uh, I'm forgetting what that is here. Then we, get, and then we start American again. So kind of we cycle it around. Each year we have a different marketing logo. And these were the charities that we were always supporting. So we started those first three years with Susan G. Komen. We then went to Buddy Check 12. And then in whatever year this was, we went to Canines, um, the Wounded Warrior Project. And then we switched to Canines for Warriors. So we've been helping veterans for most of the past probably 12 years. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, twelve or thirteen years. Canines for Warriors was founded locally here in the St. Johns County area in Northeast Florida. It was Sherry Duvall from the same Duvall family, that golfer fame. Her son is a golfer. Her husband was a golfer. Um, she founded this after her son came back from um, the Middle East, from Iran and Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and he had PTSD. And she found that none of the existing VA solutions were working for PTSD and, and other physical. Um, ailments, people who lost limbs, um, really serious injuries. And she realized that dog therapy was the thing that was helping all these guys. So she started her own charity out of a house in Ponte Vedra. And we were involved with them back when they were still in that house. They now have a huge campus here in Nocatee where they can have upwards of 100 plus dogs that they have in training and probably two to three dozen warriors who are there. What they do is they bring them in from all over the country. The dogs have to go through almost a year long training program because they're basically trained service animals certified. They bring them in for three weeks, they put them for on hands and tra hands on training with the animals and get them basically certified with the animals to go back and live. They have a very high success rate, they're like 99. Dogs yeah, they're all rescue dogs. That's the cool thing is they, they rescue both the veteran who's got serious problems and the dogs that comes from um, rescue dogs. Mm -hmm. Very high success rate. They don't euthanize any dogs. The dog fails out of the program, they find a home for it. Um, they follow up on all the veterans. They have higher than 99.5% success rate. And what they call success rate is, is that the veteran is significantly reduced medications, um, back to work, back to school, marriages repaired, all these things, critical life events that has these veterans going back. And they have so many testaments, it's just huge how successful it's been. Um, we wanna show you a quick video here from, I believe this was 2006, I'm gonna have to, kill this and come back. Why is my Mac not responding? There it is. We were actually featured on, does anyone remember Corbin's Ride On? It was a show on Speed Vision. This week on Corbin's Ride On. We'll check out the cutting edge for custom do-it-yourselfers. Plus, in Shop Talk, we'll troubleshoot your bike's fuel injection system. But now, we're on the fly with the mustache guy, Dennis Gage, at one of the coolest bike shows ever. So hold on tight. Riding into History is an annual event held at the World Golf Village just north of St. Augustine, Florida. It's a fantastic place to display a breathtaking collection of some of the great bikes of motorcycling's world history. Well, Riding in History is a celebration of the motorcycle. We want the whole public to know that motorcycling has a great history of beautiful machinery. A lot of people know motorcycles as those uh, things going down the street with the loud pipes. And we really want to show them it's a lot more than that. It's tremendous history from all over the world. The German bikes are what interests me the most, so that's why I put it on my calendar. We got everything here from British to American to Italian. It's absolutely fabulous. It's very, very difficult to accumulate uh, this number of fancy and fabulous motorcycles in one spot at any one time and this is an outstanding display. It's great, it's my first time here, I've heard nothing but good stuff so I had to come and see it and uh, it's a first class event. Well number one, it is a charity event, every penny we make goes to charity so there's no self-serving element, everybody here is a volunteer, not one paid staff member, people work year round on this event and we really try to get the top quality motorcycles in the country here and we think we have the prettiest spot on earth just to show off these bikes. Came back because, well, let's look around. This ambiance, the feeling, the, 
Uh, where, do you, where do you get to see this many motorcycles and walk around in this kind of weather? Uh, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. It's, uh, it's really couldn't, couldn't be a more perfect uh, setting as well as a pretty darn nice day too. Well, I think for one thing, it's, you've got to admit it's good weather down here. And for us Eskimos that live up north, it's really good weather. But it's in a, a good surrounding and it's a circular drive, you know. They're not jam-packed in a hall, they're not jam-packed in a car park. Here you've got green grass, you know, you can walk around, you can stop by and have a, something to eat or drink and, or an ice cream and carry on and, you know. And before you know where you are, you're back in the beginning. It's open to the public. We charge a nominal fee to get in. All the money, of course, goes to charity. We don't charge anybody anything for entering their motorcycle in the event. I felt that it was a very, very a uh, neat event in not only that we've got a, so many great motorcycles here, but it's also serving a, uh, to, to help a charity. Buddy Check 12 was founded about 13 years ago in Jacksonville, Florida by Jeannie Blaylock, the anchor person of First Coast News. And she's helped thousands of women catch breast cancer in the early stages. There are over a half million people registered in her program, not only in Jacksonville, but all over the United States and now internationally. We've got to know the people who are in charge of this. They are absolutely dedicated to the cause. Uh, they, 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 they love motorcycles and they love doing so for the community and we'd like to be a part of that when we can. When you look at a lot of the, the modern bikes, they're all the same. When you look at Italian bikes, they like women, they're all different. You know, shape, size, whatever. There's a lot of bikes I haven't seen in a long time here. I, 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 get, I got to see some last year. My favorite happens to be the Scott uh, Supercharged Road Racer over here. Did you get to see that? Where have you ever seen a Scott Supercharged Road Racer? They have character to them. You know, they're not computer designed. They had somebody there actually with a pencil and paper and maybe a slide rule and they designed them. This year we're lucky to have Dennis Gage here as our Grand Marshal. That was kind of uh, number one on our wish list. At Dennis' request, we put together a special vintage ride. We offered him to go for a ride and he said, gosh, wouldn't it be neat if we could do all vintage bikes? So we got about a dozen old vintage bikes together and went riding around the countryside and we, had, we really just had a blast. Dennis uh, brought his toaster tank BMW down and uh, he was leading the way. And we had a great time riding around through St. Augustine and all of North Florida. Hold on, Grand Marshal Dennis Gage lets down the only hair he has. Plus, more from the Riding in the History Concourse, next on Corbin's Ride On. This year's Riding into History Motorcycle Show at the World Golf Village included a spectacular vintage run, featuring a cool collection of flashes from motorcycling's past. Rolling through the St. Augustine backroads with Grand Marshal Dennis Gage in the lead on his 73 Toaster Tank Beamer. Jack Wells brought 17 motorcycles to the event, plus one Swiss Army bicycle. But we had to find out what was up with this machine, a vintage Abingdon King Dick. An Abingdon King Dick was uh, produced by the uh, Abingdon Tool Company in Abingdon, England, uh, from the turn of the century, about 1895 or so, uh, on through 1933. Uh, the owner uh, eventually changed the name from an Abingdon motorcycle to King Dick. Uh, he had a, a prize bulldog and he wanted a more catchy name for his motorcycle company so he called it the King Dick. 
and uh, he produced uh, several models, a, a single, which mine is a 500cc single, and also some twin, twin cylinder motorcycles. So it's a pretty big thumper, really, you know, <laughs> a nice size machine. It was uh, built around uh, basically similar to a, a bicycle frame. You start it by pedaling the bicycle while it's on this, the rear stand and get it started, or it can be pushed as well to get it going. They're very rare. Uh, I really can't tell you exactly how many are left in the world. I found mine in New Zealand, uh, where uh, a son of a, a recently deceased uh, a uh, man who was 85 years old was still riding it on the New Zealand Mail Run Rally uh, up until just two years ago. John Landstrom brought a wonderful collection of bikes, including one of the truly historic milestones in the development of the motorcycle. I brought my oldest BMW, 1925 R32, and that's the first uh, motorcycle that BMW made. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but they made motorcycles before they made automobiles. and. Um, a lot of the things about this R32 are still uh, uh, carried over today. It's a still an opposed twin. It's got shaft drive. It was designed by Max Fritz. Story is uh, he was an aircraft engine designer, and uh, they were so pleased with his uh, design that they uh, put a stove in his office after he designed the bike, so he had his own heat. I know of about 10 here in the United States, and uh, I'm sure there's a few dozen throughout Europe but uh, you don't see one every day. I would definitely say it's number one. It sits in my office normally, right in front of my desk. I don't have any windows in my office, but I can look at this motorcycle anytime I want. This is what I would like to see motorcycle events become, because um, too often we're out in some dusty field somewhere, and I think it just raises the level a little bit, and um, we deserve it. We, we love our, our bikes, and uh, we have a lot invested in them, and this is the kind of places that I'd like to come to. When you grow up with all these bikes, you know, like I can remember bikes from the 50s, and I see one here, I, it brings back memories. So that's what I like about it. There, there's so much to so much to see in the southeast. We live in California now, so it's, you gotta you gotta think ahead before you come back here. Yeah, we like this area. We I like this uh, show. We're trying to bring the most elegant, historic, memorable motorcycles in the world in one place, where everybody can come out and enjoy them and just have a great time. So I think in the future it's going to be more of the same, only bigger and better. So that was 15, 16 years ago, and it still is going on. We're still running it, and it's grown bigger and bigger every year. Of course, it becomes more and more complex every year and gets more expensive, but we still manage to pull it off and bring out really good crowds. I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint real quick. because This year will be April 24th, which is basically three months from today, three months from this weekend. And as you know, last year we had to cancel. We canceled slash postponed. So it was supposed to be April last year with Wayne Carini as our Grand Marshal. You know, people familiar with Wayne Carini, chasing classic cars. He's actually a very big bike guy. Um, he agreed immediately. We called him up. He said, oh, I'll be back next year. Not a problem. Let's reschedule. So we rescheduled. Same everything. We're, we're, we're putting on this year that we planned to last year. Otherwise, we've got we to get all our entrants back, our bike, people with the bikes, because some people, you know, not available this year that were last year but right now like i said we just opened registration and demand is huge we got a lot of people um submitting their bikes ready to go uh, bill one thing uh bill and i met wayne carini at barber i'm sure a lot of you have been to the barber motorsports park and the events they have there we met wayne there and asked him if he'd like to be our grand marshal because we knew of his interest in motorcycles and he said he would but he was a little iffy and so I asked uh, later Bill Warner, who runs the Amini Island Concord Elegance for cars, which is probably the second biggest show in the world after Pebble Beach, asked Bill Warner if he would talk to Wayne Carini about it. Now, Bill Warner is probably one of the top five car people in the country. And he called Wayne Carini, and then he said, okay, Bill, you call Wayne Carini. I think he's, he's set to go. So I called Wayne, and I said, Wayne, are you ready to go? You ready to be our Grand Marshal? He said, Bill, let me tell you something. If Bill Warner calls me and says, come to Jacksonville and stand naked in the middle of, nine, of 95 at 5 o'clock, I'll be there. So <laughs> that's the kind of weight that Bill Warner carries around. <laughs> Wayne Carini is a terrific speaker. He's going to speak at the uh, dinner before, which is the night before the, the Concour. You all can come to that if you'd like to. And he's going to be at the Concour signing autographs and talking to people. Just a great guy. He's about that tall.
but, he, but he's a tremendous guy, and I think you'd really enjoy meeting him. And you can go on, if you have an entrant in the, the concourse itself, you can go on, you're eligible to be one of those first 50 people or so that can go on the Grand Marshal ride and go for a ride with them, which is really cool because we go out for a couple hours. We go on a really nice ride. As you saw from Dennis, you know, we go take a really nice ride around the country. It's, it's kind of cool. I, I could sit here and tell you stories like the ride I did with Scott Parker was just phenomenal. I'll have to tell you that afterwards, but it was a lot of fun. Did you see a, an area there, that ring around that you see around the lake is where this all the bikes are. And it's just a tremendous place to see motorcycles. It's a gorgeous spot. It's all tree covered, so it's nice and cool. Yeah, this picture is probably from the early 2000s. So those trees have now all grown in. So you're actually sitting under a canopy of trees with all paver stones. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Bill, that's I-95 across the top. Of yeah, this is I-95 in the background. So there is literally its own exit. The World Golf Village has its own exit off I-95. It's, it's called World Golf Village Parkway. You pull off there and we will have signs everywhere to, to come in. There's plenty of parking um, and the facilities are just grand. It's just phenomenal. And we have, we have everything from entertainment and um, good food, bicycles, mini bikes, scooters. Um, like I said, we're very focused right now on being antique. We've gotten more selective and we're not having any problem with that. In fact, I just looked at our roster the other day before I came here and I had all kinds of 1920s and 1940s Indians and Harleys and BMWs and stuff. So we're getting the finest collectors want to bring their bikes out and participate. Um, who's that? Yeah, he's, his F40 is, is based out of Connecticut. Correct. And this, uh, I'm going to run you just through some pictures. Um, as I stated earlier, this whole thing happens because of volunteers. I mean, there is riding into history is really just a shell company. It's run by it's sponsored by the two promoting clubs which is now really just BMW NEF because ABVMC did fold somewhere shortly after that early history. And HMS, well, as I'm gonna say, we have like five different clubs that really run the event, sponsor it, and the BMW club is the main promoting club at this point. So we'll show you some pictures of all the people and, and some of the stuff involved. That's the World Golf Hall of Fame right there, that tower. We actually have the dinner is right in this main hall here. So our Grand Marshal Banquet, having dinner with Wayne Carini, whoever our Grand Marshal is each year, is in there. It's a spectacular setting. It's actually inside the museum. It's just a really top-notch setup. Excuse me? I believe it's seventy-five dollars this year. You have to go look at our website. Don't quote me on that, but it's in that range. Um, and it's, of course, Wayne would be the featured speaker. We have a silent auction, lots of different things. It's a lot of fun. And the motorcycle show itself is fifteen dollars. Yes. That basically our business model is, is we charge admission. It's $15 for the thousands of people who come in to see this show. And that's the money we raise between that and silent auction and selling t-shirts and memorabilia at our store is the money we raise that we give to the charity. That's how we basically raise money. These side events like uh, the, the ride and stuff, those are just like amenities for the people who bring their bikes. Well, over the years, we're probably, I can't say for sure, but it's, it's definitely over half a million. It's probably closer to over $600,000 that we, we've raised for those three different charities, the Susan G. Komen, the Buddy Check 12. So it's come a long way. Yeah, the last year we ran, which was 2019, we raised $50,000 in the weekend, which is a lot of money to give to a great charity organization that's supporting our veterans. Um, and especially, you know, this year in particular, they've had a very rough year because most of their money they raise is through fundraisers of people like us who do community events. And of course, everybody had to cancel because of COVID. So, you know, the organizations like that are really starving. They don't get a lot of money from the government. They basically run based on um, money raised by volunteers. So this is what usually starts the event. On Friday morning around 9 o'clock, we get together and we start the Grand Marshal Tour. Like we said, it's invitation only. You have to register a bike. And once your bike is accepted into the event, we send you a personal invitation, say, would you like to go on the ride? So it's first come, first serve. When we fill up and get 50 bikes, 60 people, we close. So it's... It starts in the parking lot of the World Golf Village, and you can see it's led by our Grand Marshal. And it doesn't have to be a bike you put in the show, but it has to be a vintage bike. We don't want people coming out with their brand new 2020 RSs. Like, I can't go ride my 2020 RS on this ride. They throw me out. Um, you gotta have a vintage bike, because that's the whole point. We're going down the road with all these great vintage bikes, and people will ride some really old stuff. We've had people ride you know, 1930s, 40s bikes, and. You know, not a problem. As long as they make it there, we're all cool. We, we do have a chase van and all that stuff, but, you know, they are old bikes. Um, but we have a lot of fun with it. It's really a lot of fun. We go out to somewhere really nice for dinner. In this case, we had just gone out to, I believe that was Harry's, yeah, lunch rather, Harry's, 
down in downtown St. Augustine. So we took everybody on a real cool ride through the county and down the coast and parked on the waterfront and had a, a really nice lunch at an outdoor thing. And we spent a couple hours doing this. We leave at 10 o'clock. We get there at nine and register. Kick stands up at 10 o'clock. We have lunch from 12 to 1.30 or two and get back to the hotel by three or so in time to rest for an hour or two and get ready to go out to the banquet that evening. So it's a lot of fun. And it's really meant to be fun for the entrance because you know if you're bringing a bike to the show, you spend all day Saturday making sure your bike's polished, clean, judged, all that stuff. It's a chance for you to get out and come out a day early. Um, the, before we had the biker, before we had the Grand Marshal dinner on Friday evening, we had it usually well, as we started with the biker's ball on Saturday. And you'll see some of the attire, which was basically anything goes. It was, it was casual, but it was kind of a riff off the black tie kind of thing. So we had people wear all kinds of crazy costumes. It was a lot of fun. Um, and a true ball kind of thing. There was dancing and parties and silent auction. There's Jack with his late wife, Judy. He's been, Jack's been involved in this from the very beginning. As you saw on the ride on thing, he brought 17 bikes that year in 2005. Now, if you've ever seen Jack's rig, I mean, he literally came with a rig. I mean, a rig, a tractor trailer rig. He could, he could have a professional bike shop. That's Jeannie Blaylock, who's the um, anchor woman for Channel 12, who was giving us all our promos and stuff. She and Bill used to arrange all these things where she would go out of her way. She'd go shoot things and she'd say, I need you to bring a couple bikes. We'll go down the river, we'll shoot something. And she'd do a promo and then put us on TV the day or so before, really generating a lot of interest so we'd get a lot of people out, which really helped. Um, that's um, Mark and Michelle Todd from Sergeant Seats there. And there's one Larry back there. Larry, look at you. You used to be a young man back then. You still had hair on your head. Am I wearing a tie? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but Mark and Michelle are from Sergeant Seats. You guys have heard of Sergeant Seats? They're one of our big sponsors. They're here in Jacksonville. They've been very involved for many, many years. Um, we used to put a lot of bikes. We'd bring out a bunch of really cool bikes and put them in the hall, in the banquet hall. Used to be a little controversial. They'd say, drain the oil and the gas out of them. And we'd kind of wheel them in and say, yeah, they're all dry. It's okay. You know? And they'd be like, oh, the firemen are going to come and kick us out. You know? um, that was some friends, Dennis and Betty Smith, who were, were very involved in it. They moved away, but they're longtime members of the club. There's Bill's wife, Valerie. The Thomases. How many bikes did the Thomases bring? No, they only bring a couple every year, but, but they were for many, many years. Yeah, and they were very nice quality. Um, when I first met Jim, I said uh, he was looking at some motorcycles when I ran into him. And I said, so, uh, do you own a motorcycle? He goes, yeah, I own a motorcycle. And his wife, Dee, who is in the uh, blue outfit there, said, own a motorcycle. He owns 70 motorcycles and 100 cars. <laughs> so, he's quite a collector. I asked him, I said, uh, may I ask, what was your career that enabled you to do this? He said, didn't have much of a career. We grew up dirt poor in Louisiana, only they found oil in our property. So he's <laughs> <laughs> he said, and True it's still story. pumping. <laughs> True story, and he's a great guy. They're both, I know, I've known them all for years. They're great people. Again, yeah, they're up in years now. cars and 100 motorcycles himself. Yeah, yeah. And, so. and they're impeccable. They're impeccable. I mean, he's a one-man machine shop. Yeah. Um, this is back when we used to have a full band and a dance floor. It was pretty lively. It was always a lot of fun. It was actually very crazy. There's Dennis and um, Craig, and there's Jeannie with her husband, Bill. Is that Anne with her daughters? I know it's Anne, yeah. but those are her two daughters. Daughter and granddaughter. A great granddaughter, exactly. Ann Carter was a longtime member of the BMW NEF club. She rode until she was 80 years old. And the only reason she stopped riding them was because she had bad arthritis and she was just concerned she couldn't run the brake. She had a red RS that she rode the wheels off of. She was super fast. When she was 79, she uh, rode uh, 1,200 miles in one day for the Iron Butt Society uh, yeah. membership. Yeah. And she would have continued running to the very end. She had uh, lung cancer and, and passed away in her mid 80s, but she would have ridden right till the end, except she could ride. She just didn't want to put anyone in danger. She says, I can ride. There's nothing wrong with me. She said, I just, you know, she, her knuckles were so knurled up from arthritis. She's like, I don't think I can work the brake well, so I'm just not going to risk it. But she was a cookie. She was a real piece of work, and she was a very good friend. Um, the Grand Marshal dinner, I didn't have a lot of pictures, Bill, because I didn't get time to go through all my pictures. But the Biker's Ball, which used to be Saturday night, we moved it to Friday night and called it the Grand Marshal dinner. And we, we didn't do the fancy costumes anymore. We just made it a, an informal banquet dinner, more about introducing you to the Grand Marshal. The Grand Marshal would give a talk, a, some kind of presentation. Sometimes we'd have multiple speakers. Um, a lot of people you'd know, industry experts and stuff. And it's a lot of fun. That's typical, like, you know, silent auction area. And you can see on the wall, those are, that's actually in the museum. We were inside the museum. So we get to host this inside the World Golf Museum. Um, 
which not many people get to do. It's, um, we have a pretty good relationship with the World Golf Village. This is our setup. This is our registration coming into it. There's Norm Nelson. He's also, he's former owner, him and his late wife, Maggie, um, are the former owners of BMW Daytona, um, the motorcycle dealer. Um, he's still very involved. In fact, he's doing our ride this year. He's also run the Cannonball. How many times? Four? Uh, this will be his fourth. I this will be his fourth Cannonball. He's running Norm Nelson. He's running it on a 1911 Reading Standard. Norm now, uh, had two perfect scores riding coast to coast on motorcycles up to 100 years old. Um, and a perfect score it means that you're the winner. And the only reason that he wasn't declared the winner is because he was, uh, his, I think he was... Lost by age. He lost by age. I think he was only 76 and the winner was 77. Yeah. Or something. So age was a tiebreaker. And you know, you're talking driving 2,500 miles cross country on a 100 year old motorcycle and not missing a turn because you lose points if you don't take the perfect navigation, which you only find out what it is that morning when they give you your instructions and set you off. And you're on a 100 year old bike with yourself. You can't have anyone stop and help you. It's really complicated. If, if you want to go check it out, go Google Cannonball and see it. It's pretty amazing. He's going to be running it again this year where it starts out of Sault Ste. Marie yeah. and goes down to Texas. Yeah. And it's in September. Yeah, um, it's been rescheduled. It, the new schedule just came out, but it is really cool. If you've ever tried to ride a one-cylinder, no-transmission, belt-drive, 1911 motorcycle <laughs> cross-country, <laughs> let alone be 76 or 77 years old and do it, um, pretty amazing. Yes, he was on a, a, actually one, it was Jack Wells BMW. Yeah, so it was a, BMWs yeah. Jack. Yep, and he and Jack worked on them, got them all, you know, wrenched, make sure they were as li reliable as possible. And of course, they were BMW, so they had yeah, no problems. Yes, he was part of the team. I de every evening. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at the concourse itself, like I said, we've always had a bunch of clubs involved, so I'll, I'll show you a panel in the end, which has all of them, but of course there's BMW NEF. I think that's Jeff in the background there, and that's Gary Foxworthy. Um, the Chrome Divas, who are over here, they're over at our yeah. tent over here. Yeah. They're very good friends, Jennifer and the Chrome Divas. They're out of Jack's Beach. It's a women's riding club, yeah. basically a Harley club. It's not necessarily mandatory, but they're the Chrome Divas. They ride, and man, they ride. I mean, Jennifer puts me to shame. She'll do 25, 30,000 miles on her bike every year. I mean, she's just crazy. Crazy, she rides cross country by herself. All good riders, all good people, all good friends. Um, we always have vendors, so we have lots of sponsors who have been with us every year. And you know, we, that's part of the allure of our overall event. You come there, there's vendors everywhere. We have dozens and dozens of vendors. We have entertainment, we have ice cream and food and food trucks and all kinds of stuff. So it's a really big all day affair. Um, although we say we're an antique motorcycle event now, we still have all kinds of specialty stuff. So we'll have race bikes, um, we will have, um, is that a, a Messer Schmidt there? That's an Azetta. Azetta, okay. We, we will have scooters, all kinds of stuff. Those are, of course, are, yeah, th those are antiques. But we will allow specialty type stuff because it's all of general interest, right? When you bring something really crazy like that that no one's ever heard of or seen from another country, another time period. Um, Dime City Cycles has been involved with this for many years. Haggerty is one of our big sponsors. Um, very good people. As I said, it's very kid kid friendly. A lot of people bring their kids and the kids marvel at this stuff. Um, we do obviously say no sitting on the bikes, except if the owner allows you to, but the kids love it. And we have everything from scooters, you know, the fifties and all the way up. And we often have people who bring that a whole collection. Where you, it's like literally walking into a dealership from 1969 where they'll have like every model and stuff. So it's, it's really very cool. And these guys go through a lot of trouble to restore these bikes and bring them out and share them with everybody. Um, we also have there the St. John's Power Sports. That is, that's Brad Knight from, they're actually, St. John's Power Sports is owned by Don, who owns the BMW dealership here in Jacksonville, in, in Wells Road. So that was before he bought the BMW dealership, he had St. John's Power Sports. They were Yamaha, now he's doing Yamaha boats there, and he does Ducati and BMW. And he's been a longtime sponsor. The CMA, the Christian Motorcycle Association, the St. Augustine chapter, have been longtime partners. They do a lot of our parking lot and other things and been part of our management team. Um, yeah. I have one of those. Oh, that, that's why people love all the old stuff that, that like Nobby said earlier, Nobby Clark, who we lost about three years ago, he said her in that the Corbin's right on. He says, you'll see stuff that you remember as a kid. And so funny because I see bikes that as a kid I thought were humongous bikes. And I'm like, that SL70 is only like this big. When I was a kid, 
that was like huge, you know? And it's, it's funny how it plays on your memories. It, it really does. But people marvel over that stuff. They'll, they, and they want to stop and talk to the owners about where'd you get this? What'd you do? I had one of those. It's, um, people spend all day just walking around there, just marveling at the bikes, stopping for lunch, having a drink, whatever. Um, you can see the, just the variety and the quality of the bikes that come out. There's Mitch Beam. And there's Millie. There's Vicky, who's here today. Vicky's not in the room right now, but everybody knows Vicky Decker there. And that's Kevin Schwantz. Um, these are all club members, you know, all involved. That's our charity store. We, you can see I'll, I'll have a section on the posters, but we'd always have our Grand Marshal signing the posters, the artwork that Don did, and I have a whole section here coming up on Don. The artist? You got pictures of the artist? Yes. It's coming up in a second. Um, we have our friends from Armour. There's Hank and... Um, why am I forgetting her name? Um, I'm sorry. But from Daytona, they were good friends. Hey, VJMC, Peter Slackoff and his wife. Um, VJMC is very involved, so the Japanese Vintage Motorcycle Club brings out a lot of bikes. Peter's from, Tal or from um, where Chep's from, down Pensacola area, way out that way, the you know, far panhandle. So they are very involved. They're one of our supporting clubs. Um, we have bicycles. In the case of the one on the left, I'm not sure what that is, but on the right, we have these really vintage bicycles. So, you know, you get these kind of eclectic stuff. And, and he'll ride like this big, you know, the big wheel thing. He'll ride it around the thing. It's, it's really very cool. This is why we say it's a family event. You can bring the kids, the wife. I have a lot of people tell me this is the only event my wife will go to. I go to shows all year long, but this is the only one my wife will go to nice. because it's nice. It's a really quality event. Um, many people may remember Herman from Wilbur Shocks. Many of us have put, had him put shocks on our BMWs over the years. He's been a vendor and sponsor. I've lost touch with him. I don't know if he's still here in the Space Coast area. But he may have gone back to Europe. We've had, you know, every year we've, one year we had German. I'm not sure we do German anymore exclusively. I think it gets folded in with the European version now. But um, one year we did have German as our featured mark, and it was a very big year for BMWs. There are, there's a lot of BMW collectors out there, as if we don't know that. But <laughs> they're, they're out there for sure. I mean, just, it was like a museum. It, was, it literally is like a museum of BMW motorcycles. You can see the crowds we, we typically bring out if the weather, you know, we're a fair weather event, we're rain or shine. It's planned a year in advance, we go rain or shine. Of course, if it rains, it's a big problem. So we go through a lot of trouble to try to keep us in a, the least rainiest possible day. Um, but you can see the crowds. I mean, that's, that's the whole walkway it goes around for however long it goes around. We just have crowds of people milling about, vendors all the way around, ice cream people, storefronts. Um, it's just a big, fun atmosphere. Um, and you get all kinds of people. That was the motorcycle that um, Craig was referring to. Um, we get all kinds of odds and ends things. I'm not sure what that is on the left. Is that a Morgan? Uh, I think it is. And then, uh, towing something else. Towing his motorcycle. So his three-wheeler towing his two-wheeler. His three-wheel car towing his two-wheel motorcycle. But we, we'll always enter stuff like that that we feel is of interest, general interest, to anyone who's of a mechanical bent and likes motors and you know anything mechanical. Sunshine chapter of the AMCA is one of our supporting clubs. Um, literally A to Z, look, we'll find models of things people never heard of. Um, we, of course, we got a lot of, the Japanese guys are very good. They, they really do a great job of bringing out really a lot of stuff from the 60s and 70s. Of course, a lot of them were made, but they do get very rare ones. And it's just, it's unbelievable the lengths they go through to restore these bikes. They're like better than showroom quality. We have entertainment. There's one of the guys riding the bicycles around. Um, there's Walt, one of our former chairpersons, and we get the St. John's County Sheriff's deputies come out and help us out with traffic control and, you know, policing people and stuff. That might be Jack Wells' collection right there. Probably was in 05. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, exactly. Jack brought some of his, maybe one lane of his garage or his, his airport hangar. He brought it in. Um, total quality bike. He had to put a second level on his uh, hangar because he couldn't hold all the motorcycles. And, and the spare parts and things, yeah. It's pretty amazing. Uh, a ride out to Jack's house is, is a road trip for us because you spend all day there. It's like going to a museum. It's, it's very cool. Um, we get an amazing collection of American bikes. Absolutely amazing. They're, they're signing on to the show more so now than I think they ever have because they're realizing the value of it. And there's a lot of great bikes out there. Um, a lot of them unmolested, which is really pretty cool. 
So we don't have any specialty. We, we bring in everything from all the different makes around the world. We do some special things like Winner's Circle where we've had previous year's bikes that have won. They're so good, we want to bring them back to the show, but we don't want to judge them again because it's not fair. If they've already won, they're going to beat everybody again in that class. So we, we basically put them in a winner's circle. Um, there's Peter Egan, Mert Lowell. That's um, Craig and Carol Vetter. Where was, where was that sign from? Was that one of the early biker ball entryways? Yeah, that's early biker ball. That was, yeah, that was when we were doing the biker ball. There's Dennis, the mustache guy again, and Craig Vetter. And that was the motorcycle that Craig basically designed for Triumph. And uh, that kind of, you know, he was already well on his way to stardom in terms of building the Vetter fairings, which then, you know, Honda put on the gold wing and everyone else copied. Vetter um, fairings at one time was the second largest motorcycle-related company in the United States, only behind Harley Davidson. Yeah, his company was worth almost as much as Harley Davidson at that point. That's how, how popular it was. And I mean, he made, it, he made fairings popular. You know, they, and if you remember them, they were big, but they worked and they made long distance touring possible. Um, that's Nobby Clark. Nobby was a, a wrench for all the greats. I mean, how many people can you name that Nobby was on their race team um, as a wrench? Uh, Agostini. Um, Halewood. Halewood. Yeah. I mean, all the greats. He, he spent his life, pretty much his, his younger part of his life, just traveling around the world on the circuit, on the motorcycle circuit, working for different teams. Lived in Japan for a couple of years, taught himself Japanese because um, he worked very closely with the Japanese engineers on racing engines and stuff. Really great guy. He was a great friend of the event. There's Bill with Mitch Beam. That was on our um, lunch ride. We used to stop at this little church down in the, out in the countryside. This is Gloria Strzok. She was our grand marshal, our last grand marshal. Um, she was 91 at that point. That was two years ago. And that was a picture of her from probably back in the early 40s because she, she was from North Jersey, a little town called Clifton. And her family owned a motorcycle and bicycle shop going back to like the 1910s or something. And so she grew up around motorcycles her whole life. And her brother taught her to ride a bike or convinced her to ride a motorcycle when she was a kid. And she never stopped. She's a total enthusiast. And she, she was a hoot. I mean, <laughs> the woman's just got more energy for somebody like a third of her age than anyone deserves to have at her age. This was Don Bradley, who Bill met down at Bike Week. And he's, what was his main career? He was an art teacher. Yeah, he was an art teacher. He also uh, had a Honda shop. Um, hmm. So he's a, he combined knowledge of motorcycles with a great artistic talent and did the greatest motorcycle art I've ever seen. He donated a painting to us every year that he normally would have charged $20,000 for. He gave us one every year for free to use for our boat. Trip. And he did that as long as he lived. And he did it up to 12 years. In the 13th year, he was halfway through and he died. And his daughter on the right, who is also an artist, finished the post before. Yeah. So that's his daughter, Ronnie. And that's Miles from Scotland. Miles comes over from Scotland many years. Uh, comes almost every year from Scotland to the event. Yep. Just because he says it's the best event in the world I've ever been. And he, and he goes to all the shows. He belongs to various motorcycle clubs throughout England, Britain, Scotland. He goes to all the shows in Europe. He says, we're, we're like one of the best shows. He, he flies over to come and see it. Wow. So here's some of the artwork that Don's done for the years. Now you've got to imagine the paintings literally are probably, they, they're about this physical size, no Bill, about this big? Yeah, they're almost that size. They're, they're oil paintings. I mean, he paints them by hand, and because the slide projector is not all that great, you'd see the de level of detail in everything, the nuts, the bolts, you can read the numbers off of them. That's how detailed they are. He literally, and he often will hide some what I call Easter eggs, because that's what we used to do in the software business. If you know that special command code in Windows, you hold it, it would pop up a screen, and it would say, you know, this code was written by some geek in Microsoft, you know, or some stupid thing would happen. But sometimes if you looked hard enough, somewhere in the details of these little rocks or something, you might find somebody's initials or something that was meaningful to something, because there was a story behind every one of these artworks. And the, the real story was when he first painted them, the woman was always topless. She did not have a top on. He would do that artwork, which would be the original, but then we said, well, we gotta put it on a poster and put it up in public. So he'd go back and he'd kind of airbrush a top in. So you could kind of see like typically the women's breast right here would have, would have not been exposed by the shawl over her shoulders. It would have been basically a topless photo. And then there was a story behind every one of this. He had, he had a very vivid imagination. And for every year- For a great memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, every year, 
he had a theme because, you know, he'd work on these for a year in advance. We tell him next year is going to be whatever, you know, Bill would make up a marketing scheme of, okay, this year is going to be the brilliant British bikes. Well, he would choose a British bike that he really liked, that he had to do a lot of research. He'd go do like technical research so he could get all the nuts and bolts and pieces and, and then he'd paint it. And, and you'll notice in most of these, the women are kind of hanging off the motorcycle. And I said, Don, why are all the women not seated on? He said, I didn't want to cover up any of the motorcycle. <laughs> and and the detail is just phenomenal like you, you can't see it in here but there's inscriptions yeah. all around this tape that's flying in here and he wrote a little um placard for every one of these things that had a story about what his thoughts were and it was something that transpired in his life or a particular woman as we thought inspired him to do this and we never found out he went to his death and never told us but he, he did these for years. I don't have all of them here, but you can just see the quality of them. I mean, they're, they're just absolutely phenomenal. The Japanese one was good, that shit right there. I still that have people. We go to shows every year. We go to Barbara, we go to Dana Beach, and people come up and say, do you have the one with the 67 BSA on it? Or do you have the one with the Harley on it? Do you have the one with the this? And we go looking through old folders and like, they're gone. We don't have any of them left. And I mean, people search for them because they're not left anymore. And we're not reproducing any of them. Yeah. Because he would provide the artwork and then they would make it into our poster. And Bill always used to do our posters. So you can see he specifically purpose built them that they were the right aspect ratio so they would fit on this poster. And these are full size posters. Just, they'd about, be about that real size. And these posters used to, how many we normally would print? About 500? We'd do about 500 and we'd have all our guys across our teams would go out and put them up everywhere all around the Northeast and we'd ship them to friends down in Miami and stuff. And they'd put them up in the motorcycle dealerships. Publix, wherever we could put them up, and they advertised our event. This was before you know you had social media and crap like that. We used to just advertise using these things, and people would steal them off the walls because they wanted to collect them and save them because the artwork was just so cool on them. Uh, by the way, we sent uh, Jay Luno one every year, and he has them up in his garage. Yeah, and they really are cool. We're, I have the last of them in my car outside actually because I'm taking them home to inventory them because I have so many people asking me for very specific ones, and I'm like, we only got a handful of them left, and I got them in a sleeve, you know, to protect them. I said, I, I'm going to go home and inventory them, because we're going to put them out on the web or something and sell off the last of them. So here's the clubs that have been supporting us. We have HMS, which is Bill's club, actually. It's the Historic Motorcycle Society, which is a group of us, and we don't have any dues. We don't have any, we don't have any dues. We have no dues. We have no officers. Uh, you just have to like old motorcycles and show up every week. And how many members uh, we got? We have uh, about 60 members in Jacksonville and then about another 30 members around the world. Yeah. You have yeah. to own an old motorcycle or just like them? Like them. You just have to like them, be an enthusiast. Some people are aged on and can't ride anymore but still love them. So it's just an enthusiast club. They get together every Monday. You know, we want to ride up or whatever. We get together for dinner at a local restaurant. Of course, we got the BMW NEF club, which is the main promoting club of this event. We've got the Christian Motorcycle Association, that's the St. Augustine chapter, and we're trying to get some of the other chapters involved. They do a great job helping us out. The AMCA, it's the Sunshine chapter, which is basically out of the Daytona area. Um, there's a couple different chapters. We also work closely with the, um, the Miami chapter down there, the Everglades chapter um, that puts on the Dania Beach show, show Claire Frost and um, Clive Taylor. The Chrome Divas, who are the Jack Speeds Chrome Divas, who are over here doing our table today, they're all good friends of ours. The VJMC, we saw Peter and his wife and all the folks out of the Vintage Japanese Motorcycle Club. And we actually have the Florida Airheads, Kevin Reimer, who's here this weekend, and Marty and a couple of those guys. They've just been coming on the past couple of years and they've been running our hospitality tent. So, you know, it takes a lot of work and we reach out to these clubs and its members. It's people like us who put this event on. Basically, you cannot do an event like this without getting a lot of people to come together. Yeah, it takes about 100, 100 to 125 volunteers to put this event on. And there's a core team of about 15 people on what I call the Management Operating Committee that works on it all year long because we're doing everything from securing the grounds, getting reservations, planning, advertising, marketing, all that fun stuff, planning all the events. We've had a ton of sponsors over the years, but a lot of them are still with us today and have been with us for a very long time. Sergeant Seat Products is based here in Jacksonville. Most of us have heard of them. They've Probably many of us have had their seats on our bikes. I know I have quite a few, including my 87K75 has a sergeant seat. I just put on it about a month or so ago. Um, BMW of Jacksonville, that's our local BMW dealer, Don Pacells, very big supporter, a great dealership. Adam Mac Harley-Davidson, who's been with us since the, practically the beginning. Yeah, 
Yeah, and Amex one of the oldest Harley Davidson dealers in the country. Yeah, originally they started out in New Jersey, I believe. Yeah. And they moved to Florida and they continued their their business. They've got a they got a superstore on I ninety five at Bay Meadows and they've got one on Wells Road right across from BMW Jacksonville and they've got another one up on the, the north side of Jacksonville. Yeah, and, and the one in St. Augustine, which just opened last year um, during this whole pandemic. They had a grand opening, but another mega store. Yep, longtime supporters, very good people there. We also have Gordon and Alice Leishman, who sponsor some of our awards, and Jack Wells, who sponsors some of our awards. He has an award in memory of his late wife, Judy Wells, which is very cool. It's a, it's a special award that we give out to a very special bike that Jack helps uh, us choose. We got Advice Star Credit Union, which is one of the military credit unions here that has been a financial supporter for us and we do business with them. The Haggerty folks who come out of you know, the Midwest and come down and help us out with the ride and support us in many different ways, financially and otherwise. Mercedes-Benz, we've got a good friend, Walt Brown, who's been very involved for years and a former chairman of the event, um, was a career Benz guy. He was a mechanic. He was actually, was, he was the, kind of the train the trainer guy who would go to Germany and learn all the new cars and then come home and train all the mechanics throughout the Southeast. Super smart wrench guy, good guy. Uh, Mercedes provides us with cars and things for the Grand Marshals and VIPs. Turk Oncology has been involved the past couple of years. They're a local um, physician's organization, cancer specialists, especially around men's cancer. Um, Heyman's Law, which is a, a relatively new sponsor. Chill Concepts does our websites and things. Fisher Design does all our design work for now for the posters and artwork and stuff. Um, DCP is Jim Domes. Anyone familiar with Jim Domes artwork? He's a famous uh, photographer, does beautiful artwork. He does a lot of our photography. And then Folio Weekly, which is our local newspaper here that supports us. And of course, everything we make goes to a charity. Um, we're all volunteers, nobody gets paid. So all the money we make, minus our expenses, we give to a charity, Canines for Warriors. And we're very happy to do that. They're one of the leading organizations, um, very high profile. Just go Google them and you'll just find tons of information about how good they are. So in closing, we're, we continue to run. We are an annual event. We're now in our 21st year. Um, it's all from support from the club members. It's, it's just our biggest risk right now is if we don't have enough club members. Honestly, that's our biggest risk right now if we don't get enough club members to continue to run um, the event. And that's a problem because as we all know, club members are getting older. Not everybody can do the same kind of physical work we used to do. Um, so making sure we got enough volunteers to put the event on every year. Our sponsors, without the financial money to run the thing all year long and get it set up and running, we could never do it. So I mean, between the two of them, that's the only reason this thing continues to happen. We stay very dedicated to the Canines for Warriors, we donate money, but we also help them. Several of us do like their telethons and other stuff. So we work very closely with them, very good friends with um, Rory Diamond, who is the CEO of that, as well as with Shari Duvall, the founder. Um, and over the years, we've raised well north. I just put over half a million, over 500,000, because I didn't have a minute by minute accounting, but I can tell you that's probably north of 600,000 right now that we've raised for the charity over the years. And we are set to go for this year. It's, like I said, last year we had to postpone it until this year. So we were going to be on April 24th. So as we said earlier, we used to be in May, but we're moving it earlier because of a bunch of conflicts. There's stuff going on at any given time. At the World Golf Village, you might say that you can't have it this weekend. We got a golf outing. And of course, it's Golf Village. If they say they got a golf outing, that takes precedence over motorcycles at the World Golf Village. But we're going to try to stick with that. We like the April date just because it's, um, it's a little less close to our rainy season here in North Florida. And that's our biggest risk. If we get rain, you're not going to get as many bikes to show up and you're not going to get as many people at the gate. So we're sticking with that date or trying to. We've got a silent auction this year. We're going to be auctioning off, I believe, this bike. Was this your, your ST? What is it? An ST? LS. 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 Yes. Yeah. That Bill at one time owned it. It went to another friend who's a member of this club who owned it. And we lost John. He passed away um, two and a half years ago. And it's now in our possession. We've restored it to a certain degree mechanically. It's an excellent running condition. And we're going to be auctioning that as part of our silent auction. So that's you can come out to the nice event and bike. bid on it. Anybody wants an LS, that's a really nice bike. It's got all the original factory bags and everything with it. And yep. it's going to go for a, a very fair price. Yep. And we just put all new tires on it and a ma major tune up and all kinds of stuff. Walt, our friend from Mercedes Benz, who I said is a master mechanic, he has it in his possession right now. He's just been going to town on it, putting it in tip top shape. Um, and we're going to be featuring the brilliant British bikes. Same as last year, only this time we're going to show up and do it. And we've got a huge collection of bikes coming out. The, the participation so far is probably setting records right now. We feel like there's a lot of people who really missed the past year, didn't get to go to a lot of events. And we're hoping they come out this year. 
If you want to know more about it or want to sign up for any of the events, just go to writingintohistory.org.